Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Today we're going to repair and restore a signal booster or RF preselector. So what this device does is it takes a weak radio signal and amplifies it so your radio receiver or communications receiver can hear just a little bit better. So it'll give it just a little bit better reception. So what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to look inside this device. I'll explain a little bit about the parts and pieces inside. We'll locate the faulty components, replace them. I'm going to clean the unit up. Then we're going to tune this device together. So I'll show you exactly how to tune an RF preselector. There's a bunch of hints and tricks that also follow along the same lines for receivers. I'll share those with you as well. And then we're going to try the thing out with a small communications receiver and see how much better it makes the reception. So there's a lot of neat stuff in this episode. So let's get started. This is a Trio Signamax preselector, or if you'd like to call it a tunable RF preamplifier, you could because that's exactly what it is. Well, what does this thing do? Say you're listening to a shortwave broadcast somewhere at, uh, we'll say around 20 megacycles or 20 megahertz, if you want to call it that. And say the signal's kind of weak and you're having a hard time hearing it on your receiver. So when the Trio Signamax is in the off position here, your antenna normally runs to these jacks, and then on the back side of this little unit, the antenna jacks just run out to your receiver. So when this isn't off, this is just bridged through. This is not in line. So if you want to amplify that signal, say you want to amplify that RF, you click this to the on position, and again, say we'll say your signal that you want to listen to is around 20 megacycles. So you move this needle down to the 20, like so, and you'll hear a sharp rise in the radio signal or even static, you'll hear a sharp rise and then as you pass it, it'll drop back down again. So then you want to go back and bring it right to the peak, right to the maximum sensitivity at that frequency and then you can vary the gain by using this control right here. So it's pretty much the same thing as an audio preamplifier. It has the same kind of idea behind it, except this is for RF use. So if you want to amplify a weak audio signal, you put a preamplifier in front of it to bring that audio signal up. Well, if you want to amplify RF, you put one of these things in line to bring it up. Now, there's many different types of RF preamplifiers. This is a tunable one. There's also broadband RF amplifiers out there as well. And every particular RF and audio frequency amplifier has its own purpose. So this is known as a preselector. Now, here's a little bit of a story for you guys you might find interesting. Way back when the war was happening, if you had a radio receiver, you had to own a license just to receive on a radio. Did you know that when you turn on your radio receiver as it's receiving, it's actually transmitting a signal as well? So since your radio receiver is transmitting a signal, the government way back in the day would drive around in vehicles with direction finding loops on the top and they would look for people with radio receivers. So whenever you have a radio receiver on in your house, it's actually transmitting the same time it's receiving. By putting a pre-selector in front of your receiver, so the antenna goes into this first, through the pre-selector and into the receiver, gets the front end of your receiver further away from the antenna, isolating it just a little bit more so that, I guess you could say RF leakage that would be going back out your antenna that people could track you with is now minimized by a pre-selector. So way back when, that's how they used to find people with illegal radio receivers. At any rate, so this unit here is unrestored. I don't know anything about what's inside of this. I haven't opened it up. So what we're going to do is experience all of this together. As I'm taking this thing apart, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing in real time and we'll address any issues within this little Signamax, we'll bring it back to life. And then I have a really cute little receiver that I'm gonna pair it up with. Now you can see this thing is pretty small. It's not very big, that's the size of my hand. Either I've got a really big hand or this is a really small pre-selector. So here is my industrial sized coffee cup for late nights in the lab. And you can get an idea of the size reference. So it's a, a small little unit and it'll pair up with a little receiver that I have really well. So. 
that's what the front looks like. So I have to remove all these screws around the face. I'll save you from me unscrewing all these things. I'll get that all done and we'll take a look inside. There's one screw on the rear of the unit as well. We'll take a look at the rear here in just a moment. This is the rear or back side of the pre-selector. And as you can see, not much to it. Just the jacks that run out to the receiver. One screw that has to be removed so I can get the chassis out. And it says here, S&T Sales Import Limited, distributed in Canada by. So kind of a neat little tag. It would have even been nicer if they would have installed it straight. Here you are sitting right beside me at the bench. So let's open this up together and see what's inside. So I've already done all the hard work. I've taken all the screws out and everything. Here we go. That's looking really clean. That is looking really, really nice so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reposition the camera so that you can get a better look at this. I'll be right back. Let's take a look inside. So what I'll do is I'll remove the back here. You can see all the crud and stuff that's on the top here, dust and debris. This will very easily clean up. The case is in very nice condition. So I'll just pull the cord through here. As you can see, that looks really nice. Again, real easy job to clean that up. And this is what's inside. So this is our main tuning capacitor on the top. We have uh, two tubes right here, which are going to be the amplifiers. Looks like an old diode over here. And on the bottom, it's looking very clean as well. Look at that. It's so shiny. Old filter capacitors, cherry filter capacitors that are going to need to be replaced. And the line cord here, it's looking pretty good. It's just really dirty. All in all, it looks to be in very nice condition. So I can see a few things that are kind of looking sketchy, like this little solder connection here. What I'll do is I'll just zoom on in. So let's see this solder if it'll move. Oh, look at that. That's not even connected there. So it has a path to the chassis ground here. So obviously this here was just to try and ground out the, the case to stop noise from getting in. But that obviously isn't going to be working very well. If anything, this would create noise. So that'll have to be fixed. Let's see what else. It's looking, it's looking really nice. Some pretty long flying leads off these capacitors. Spoke too soon, look at this. Number two resistor here is just kind of flopping around. Some pretty long flying leads off of these. That could be shortened up, not a big deal. All the rest of the soldering in here looks really nice. It's not, uh, not bad at all. We'll have to check the validity of these capacitors. These are 0.01 microfarad, and they look like mica capacitors, but often they hide paper inside of these. So I just want to be sure. I'm going to use that forecasting tester to test these out, and that'll tell me right now whether these things can stay or not. So we'll do that in a moment here. So it doesn't look like there's going to be a whole lot. So replacement of these caps, clean up the line cord, fix some of these connections. Look at that. And this resistor here, what is this? The rating is 1K ohm. So I'll have to find where that goes. It looks like it originally went to this point, but I wouldn't trust that. Look at this kind of hang in there. Nothing else is doing this, is it? The rest of the soldering looks okay. You know, so... Yeah, it looks, gonna look, it looks like it's going to be a, you know, a very straightforward type of rebuild. Cord's looking good. I should remove the cord and replace these grommets. Like, look at this grommet, right? It's just so crusty. So I have new grommets. I'll put, put a new grommet in there. I have to completely remove the line cord to do that because you have to put the line cord through it. This grommet here is, is still soft and it's in nice condition. And then we're going to do an alignment. We'll have to do an alignment on this thing to make sure that it's, you know, the, the dial accuracy on the 
face here is going to line up. So when we tune the receiver to say 20 megacycles, we want this to be very close to 20. Now, often with a lot of these older units, you know, they're here, here, as long as they're close to 20, it's absolutely fine. There's some scrapes in the plastic that can be cleaned up. This is still really dirty. I haven't done anything to this. You can see on the face here how dirty this is. It looks like it's been in a garage for some period of time. Yeah, lots of dirt. Let's test out a few capacitors here, and I'll give you some examples by using some new ones and some really old ones, ones that would be really faulty. And this is a brand new wax capacitor right out of the box, never been used. So we can use that to compare with. That would be about the best case scenario for a wax capacitor nowadays. So we'll test the electrolytic first. So this one here is 10 microfarad at 450 volts. So we want to test this to see if this is leaky. So the bar graph should fall really, really fast, and we should get a green light. So I'll put this onto electrolytic. One day I'm going to get the stencils on the box. It's all about time, right? So I'll put this onto discharge. So the red lead goes to positive. The sense lead goes to negative, just like so. I'll just put this down. I don't want the leads to touch because this is so sensitive that it'll read the resistance through these silicone boots. So I'll just move the focus onto the device. There we go. And we'll see how quickly this falls off. That is a very good 10 microfarad capacitor. When I click this to discharge, you'll get a bit of a flash here. And that discharged this capacitor. So this is 10 microfarad. So we're going to compare that to another 10 microfarad capacitor. This is the one that is out of that little trio pre-selector. There's two of them here. So I'll put the sense lead here and the positive lead here. Taking note, positive. This is the line side here. You can usually tell the positive on these capacitors because it's the insulated end. And then the negative lead is the can. So I'll put that here. And we'll try that test again. So now if you recall how long it took for the other one to fall. As you can see, the truth of the matter is we could sit here all day and that's not going to budge. So these capacitors are very, very leaky. So I won't even touch anything. I'll just grab the discharged capacitor here and I'll put this on and there we go. Quick example. So we can definitely see that this is faulty. So I'll get this one out of the way. I'll test this one really quickly. So we definitely wouldn't want to have these in circuit. If I was to plug in that little pre-selector, this could very easily damage the transformer or the diodes. These are extremely leaky capacitors. Even a slightly leaky capacitor right now would have gone down in the electrolytic position here. And that's pretty leaky. Now, when I designed this device, I designed it to be pretty picky because I'm a pretty picky fella. And when I grade components, I only want to put the best components inside what I rebuild or what I restore. So when I designed this, I designed this around that thought process. So I'll get this out of here. Definitely tell that those are bad. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this onto the paper position. So this is paper and poly. So this is a 0.01 microfarad capacitor here. Get that into focus. That's a 0.01 microfarad 103. So I'll attach this here, and we'll see how quickly that goes down. Look at that. Very fast. I'll do that again, because I had it on test. Very, very fast. So if we were to, say, test the same value in a paper-style capacitor now, right? The paper in these capacitors goes acidic, so... Hook it up this way. Actually, this is good here. 
This is the outside foil end. And this would be the inside, so this would be shielding the rest of the capacitor. All right, so here we go. Now you recall how quickly this one here went down, right? It's a brand new capacitor. Extremely leaky capacitor. Right out of the box, brand spanking new. So when you see capacitors like this on eBay, or when you see Bumblebee capacitors on eBay or any of those capacitors, there's a really good chance that they're bad. They're very, very leaky. So always keep that in mind. Don't be led astray by a lot of the fluff that's out there about all of these different styles of capacitors. They're very leaky. This is a low voltage leakage tester. So this is testing these capacitors at a, a lower voltage than a high voltage tester, and yet telling us that there is leakage resistance inside these capacitors. So if a low voltage tester can see this type of resistance inside this capacitor, when you're buying a bumblebee capacitor, a lot of people seem to say that, oh, you know, it's, it's running at reduced voltage and it's not going to matter. Well, reduced voltage, excessive leakage. Again, very picky device. So now, this is the same thing. This is a 0.01 microfarad capacitor, as it says on this side right here. You can see that 0.01. I'll just move the focus into the middle here. And then I can get this a little closer so you can see that 0.01 microfarad. So the color coding on these things changes a little bit with these types of capacitors. But when you work with these things for long enough, you really get to know what's going on. So on this capacitor, how you read this is this is going to read in picofarad. So we have brown, black, black, red. So this is the multiplier here. So the multiplier is red. So that's the number two. If you can remember to just replace that number with zeros. So if it's the number two, put two zeros there. If it was orange, it would be number three. So you would put three zeros there. So we have brown, which is one, zero, 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 zero. 10,000 picofarad is 0 0.01 microfarad. Green is five. That means that this is a 500 volt rated part. And the next one is black here, which is a tolerance, which means that this is 20%. So, not very accurately rated, but still, let's see what it does. 0 0.01 microfarad is really, really high for a mica style capacitor. So let's see if this is going to be good. So I'll put this on to discharge, make it more of a surprise. Okay, put this here and here. Okay, I'll move the focus back over onto the machine here. So now this is in the paper and poly position. The center is mica and forecast. That is an extremely sensitive position. I'll explain that here in just a moment. So here we go. See how quickly that goes down? So equivalent to this right here. Now these capacitors are so good that they will even test in the mica position or the forecast position. So what I'm going to do is discharge this capacitor. I'm going to put it into the mica and we'll see if this goes down. So here we go. So now this may take a little longer because this is so extremely sensitive. No problems. This is a very good capacitor. If it passes the forecast test, the internal resistance in this thing is nil. You want to see an example of internal resistance? I will grab the silicone of this lead and I will grab the silicone of the sense lead and look at what happens. That's how sensitive to resistance this is. This is seeing my body resistance through a silicone lead on this side and through a silicone lead or a silicone boot on each side. That's how sensitive this is. 
So the internal resistance in this device is absolutely nil. Now these newer poly capacitors are much the same. These newer poly style capacitors like this one here, this will even test in the forecast position itself. So I'll just put this in here and try it out here. And you'll see this one moving down as well. In fact, it even moves down faster than this capacitor here. So this capacitor here could be some form of a dye film, or it could even be, I, yeah, I have a hard time believing that there is paper inside this. If it is, it has been very well sealed, or they've used something to preserve what is inside this. Now the leakage is nil on this device, but you want to know what? We're going to open this thing up and we're going to find out what is actually in this thing. So if there is paper inside this, I'm just going to replace this with this right here, right? These are just used as RF bypass capacitors inside that unit. So we'll open this up and see what's actually in here. Again, if it is paper, it's been sealed very well and it's preserved very, very well. So let's find out. For all you skeptics out there, here's an older high voltage type of tester. What I'll do is I will test this in the paper and mica position and I'll bring it right to 500 volts. That's the maximum rated voltage of this capacitor right here. So I'll put this in the clip. This is disconnected from the high voltage right now and I have this down at six volts, just to be careful. So there it is in the test clips. I'll move this up to 500 volts and here we go. No problems at 500 volts. So as you can see, it's not leaking. So now what I'll do, this automatically discharges this capacitor as well. But what I'm going to do, just to be safe, because I don't want to get buzzed, is I'll move this over here and just make sure. Okay. So to give you an example, here's a paper capacitor that was tested in the low voltage leakage tester and it shows as extremely leaky. So I'll put this in here and just give you an example of this one here. So I have to use the paper and mica, same one. Okay, so I'll just move this down to six volts and we'll see at what voltage it detects leakage in here. So here we go. No leakage, not seeing leakage at all at six volts. 20 volts, you can see it's trying. 100 volts, 200 volts, 300 volts. That's definitely excessively leaky at 300 volts. Let's see if we go back to 200. It's still showing leakage at 200 volts. So you can see this capacitor is definitely faulty. So now it'll do. Let's discharge this just to be sure. As you can see, this one's rated for 400 volts and was leaking badly at 300 to the point to where the eye wouldn't even open. If you recall on the leakage tester, that proved this to be faulty at under 30 volts. That's how sensitive that device is. So, just for comparison, we'll take the brand new capacitor here. This is rated at 630. I'll show you how quickly this thing here will open. I'll just put this right up to 500 just to save some time. Watch this. That is a good capacitor. No problems there. So when you let the switch go, it's supposed to automatically discharge these, but I never take the chance because I don't feel like getting a very bad shock today. So there you go. Low voltage leakage tester tests these things at below 30 volts and proves that out without having to use this incredibly high voltage to do the same thing. I've done another video on just a dedicated video on that leakage tester. If you're more interested in that particular tester, I'll link the video just below the show more tab below the video description. So right below the video description in capitals, you'll see show more, just click on that and it'll expose a bunch of links. 
if you're interested in building this device, if you're interested in building this device, again, I'm very picky, so when I put this thing together, I'm, I kind of have you know, stringent specs for these things when, I want, when I'm testing my own components, but if you're interested in building a device like this, it's all on Patreon, all the schematics, all the circuit diagrams, the explanation on how to build this, you know, the printed circuit board layouts and everything are all there, so you can put one together yourself with parts lists and everything. It's a nice addition to any bench, and I use this thing all the time. Okay, it breaks my heart to wreck such a beautiful looking little capacitor, but it's in the name of science. Let's see what's inside this capacitor. So safety glasses on. Not trying to open. Crackle, crackle, crunch. Boy, is that ever put together well. Okay, I think we're in. And yes, it is a mica capacitor. Very nice capacitor. See that there. So, let's dissect this further since we're already here. Grab a small screwdriver. Yeah, definitely can see the mica sheets. Just like that. That's some nice mica right there. So, they are mica capacitors. Those new poly capacitors that I just tested, that little yellow one here, believe it or not, has less leakage than this mica. Pretty amazing for these capacitors. I have a whole list of these parts. Again, up on Patreon, I took a bunch of time to grade so many components and there's a huge parts list up there so if you're into restoring guitar amps or radios or whatever you're into restoring that uses these types of capacitors it's a huge list up there that may be beneficial to you and there's recently a video up there explaining the differences in a whole bunch of different styles of components i had an entire sheet just full of littered with little teeny components and i explained which you know what each component did so uh even some pretty strange things like photomodulators and things like that are in there. Some pretty bizarre components. Anyways, so this is definitely a mica capacitor, so the other ones can stay. I'm not worried about those at all. And this one here, since it's just an RF bypass capacitor, I'm not worried about it at all. So I'll use this. Now, here's one thing. Mica capacitors are very, very good capacitors dealing with heat, so they don't drift. So, very, very minute drift. You could not install this capacitor into an oscillator circuit where it's in some form of an oscillator circuit. If it was used as an RF bypass capacitor in an oscillator circuit, no problems. But if this is anywhere in the active oscillator circuit, you cannot do that because this will move around with temperature incredibly. And this is the reason that mica capacitors are used inside of VFOs and in the oscillator section inside radios and things like that. So always keep that in mind. Never use a, a poly style capacitor like this in, in an application like that. There are different types of poly capacitors that can be used in oscillator circuits like polystyrene capacitors. But this type of a poly capacitor, you wouldn't want to do that. This is absolutely fine for audio chain work and for RF bypass and things like that. I'll talk a little bit more about where certain capacitors should go in circuit in future videos here. So just something to keep in mind. Still breaks my heart to open this thing up with such a nice capacitor. Oh well, again in the name of science. The underside of the chassis is pretty much done. It's almost ready to try out at this point. So I've put in a new grommet here, put in a new line cord. Now I installed the capacitors underneath these terminal tie strips here, they don't touch the bottom portion of the chassis, so they're suspended between. And the legs are soldered to these two tabs, so that cleans this area up a whole lot. 
and allows for more movement because there's a knot in the line cord here to act as a strain relief. So I don't want this bumping into those capacitors. I also put some tubing on the legs of these two resistors here so that they don't touch. This one here goes behind this one here. It's spaced a ways away from it. You can't see that in the shot here. But this is that high heat tubing, the stuff that you find in a toaster. So that's on these legs here to keep everything nice and insulated. That cleaned this whole area up a lot. In fact, I resoldered a whole bunch of these tabs on here as well. The, uh, the soldering wasn't all that great. That capacitor that we crushed, one of these ones here, was sitting right over here and that's been replaced with this poly capacitor right down here. So there's not a whole lot to really do on the underside of this chassis. If these were paper capacitors, they would all need to go, but they're fine. They're all mica capacitors. This here hasn't been addressed yet. I should address that. In fact, I can probably address that right now. So what I'll do is I'll just put that there and I'll vacuum. Vacuum the solder off this. You see absolutely no connection there whatsoever, right? So, I'll scrape this here. That should be okay. Put that right on top of that. Make sure there's tension so that's pressing down on that little spot that's been scraped right there. And I'll plug in the big fella here. Just move this over here. And add a bit of solder. So what I'll do first is I'll put just a drop of RA flux on here, like so. And that is a good connection. That is not coming off. That is one with this capacitor body. Now I don't want to touch it with my plastic tuning tool because it's nice and hot, but see, that'll never come off. So what I'll do now is I'll just clean this off, clean this little area off here. I like to use lacquer thinner to clean off this RA type flux. Now, if you're going to ever use lacquer thinner on anything like this, you got to do it in a well-ventilated area and, you know, use the appropriate precautions listed on the actual can itself. Lacquer thinner attacks paints, you know, hence lacquer thinner, right? So it attacks paints and things like that and even some plastics. So you have to be very careful with lacquer thinner around certain things. So this here should be absolutely fine because this is a little metal body here and it should be fine around this substance here, which is a harder plastic and it won't attack this plastic. So it'll be okay here. So I'm going to do that, get that all cleaned up. And then at that, after that, at this point here, I should say what I'm going to do is take the knobs off of the face and I'll remove this bezel here, which is pretty easy to get at. There's just a bunch of screws on the back. So I'll remove those screws and I'll be able to get this bezel off. And then I'll just clean this all up with a mild detergent. Now, whenever you're cleaning a face with any type of paint, no matter what kind of coat it is, and you know, that has lettering on it, things like that, lettering and numbering, you want to be very, very careful with the type of detergent that you use. Here's a thing that you should know if you're ever working on some of the older transmitters, like say you're working on an EF Johnson or something like that, and they have a really nice looking dial. Well, don't try to clean the dial on the inside with water or anything like that because they're water decals. And if you get water on them, they just come right off the face just like that. So you got to be very, very careful around EF Johnson. Now, I don't know what this is. This could be a paint. I haven't got this off at this particular point. So we'll have to be very, very careful and you know, try some you know, mild detergent in an inconspicuous area. And if it is a paint, um, you know, I can clean it very, very quickly. If it isn't a paint, you got to spend a lot of time with a Q-tip in there and... You know, make sure everything is nice and clean. And I'll use a bit of plastic polish on the outside here and maybe try and get rid of some of the scratches. So whenever you're using any type of detergent or any type of cleaner, you always want to try it in an inconspicuous area first because if, you know, you go in there just a blazing all over, you know, you might find that the paint will just, you know, it'll destroy the paint or something like that. So you can never be too careful, especially with this older equipment, right?
So that's what I'm going to do. And then after that, we'll try the thing out, see if it at least works. And then we'll perform an alignment. We'll align this thing up and then see how well it works after the alignment. So it should be a lot of fun. The face cleaned up really nice. So what I used was Windex. I tried it on a very inconspicuous area and it took all of the garbage off of the face. So lots of debris came off. The rags were extremely dirty. I cleaned up the plastic. That turned out really well. There's a little bit of a scratch here that's very, very deep. So I polished that up and you know, that's, that's way down in there. So I'm gonna have to live with that. Other than that, the plastic looks really nice. The bezel cleaned up really well. Now, one of the things that was kind of disappointing about this unit, mild thing, is you can see how the main tuning knob has this little ring that's pressed into it. Well, all of these knobs are missing those rings. So, kind of a mismatched set, and some of them have glue. Let's see if I can find one with the glue on it. There's a bit of glue on here that was used to hold that ring, so these won't clean up very nice. So, until I can find a matched set of these knobs, I found these ones here, which look really, really nice. So, and they've got nice little white pointers on them. They should fit on here very, very nice. That'll look really, really good. So, just lay those on here like so, as if they were going to be on. They still need to be cleaned up. There's dust on them and stuff. And then, the one for the tuning is just a little bit larger. Now, the nice thing about this is it's... Now about the same size as this, and all three of the knobs match, and it should look really, really nice. One thing I noticed about the bezel is they have these nice fins here, and the knobs cover up those fins. The stock one's even worse. It gets rid of them all pretty much. It's too bad they didn't have these just a little bit further out. And if you were to use a really small tuning knob, you'd still see the effect of those fins, because those fins are kind of a real nice-looking Art Deco touch to this thing, right? So, when this is on, you know, it's going to end up covering them up like that. Unfortunately, but what do you do? So, I'll get the plastic put back in here and I'll clean everything up and, and de-dust everything here and put these back on. I also cleaned these up, little binding posts and everything. And at that point, we're pretty much ready to try the thing out and do an alignment. The pre-selector is reassembled and it's ready to test and align at this point. But just before we do that, let's test the two vacuum tubes to make sure that they're okay. Now, I always say the best test for a vacuum tube is the circuit it lives in, and that's very true. But this little unit here has no speaker, no S meter. It only really has a jewel lamp. So there's no way to really tell if these tubes are working before we get started with the testing and alignment. So we'll use the tube checker just to verify these two vacuum tubes. I'm pretty sure they're to be okay. The unit itself looks like it has very low time on it and tubes are very, very dependable. So at any rate, what I'll do is I'll remove this tube first and we'll set the tester up and test it out. So to remove the tube, you press down on the shield and give it a twist and it just kind of pops up. You can see that spring in there. You see the locking mechanism on the bottom of the shield. So this is off. There's no AC applied to it and all the capacitors are discharged at this point. So you definitely want to make sure that the line is unplugged before you test tubes in anything. Often I get the question, is it okay to touch the glass of a vacuum tube with your bare hands? Yes, it's absolutely fine. It's just standard glass. Nothing's going to happen. And in the end, if you want, you can be very careful and wipe your fingerprints off if it makes you feel better. You got to be careful with this writing on the vacuum tube. If you use any type of a cleaner, usually this stuff just comes right off. So you got to be very, very careful. This is almost like a powdery substance by now. So any of you that have cleaned vacuum tubes in the past will know exactly what I'm talking about. If you had Windex on a, on a rag and you did one swipe, then all of those letters would be gone with one swipe. Got to be very careful with these things if you want to retain the, the numbering and lettering system and the name and all that kind of stuff. So, 6BA6. I've already got this 6BA6 just above the red line here, so I use the roll chart. I also have a, a book with the extended uh, information or paperwork for this unit, but it's right here, so it just makes it easier to see. So, it says Type 2. We want to put this onto Type 2. We also want to make sure that the line is right in that little black area. So this adjusts the line cord. So that would be too low. That would be just right. 
and that's a little bit high. So you want it right in that little black area. Now, some vacuum tubes draw a lot of current. When you plug the tube in, it'll go below. So what you want to do is bump this up then to make sure that this is within that line area. Something to remember when you're using these testers here. So it says 6.3 for filament. So we want to make sure that that's at 6.3. This is very important. If you plug a vacuum tube in and this is set wrong, you can damage the vacuum tube. We want to set the plate to 23. So this is the plate. We'll put that to about 23, right about there. It's close enough. Top, it says A, B, E, and F. So you go A, B, E, and F. And it says bottom, D, and G. And we're ready to plug our tube in and test it out. So basically all these switches are just connecting different areas to the vacuum tube. This will test lots of vacuum tubes. The uh, model it 17 is a great tube tester. I've had lots and lots of tube testers. I even have a, a stand-up one, which you've seen in lab too. This tube tester by far is one of the most versatile testers that I've ever owned. And I've owned a lot of them. So the reason that I'm not testing it yet is I have to push test here. Is I have to wait for the vacuum tube to warm up. This is an indirectly heated vacuum tube, so that little pipe in the center of the vacuum tube has to glow orange before this tube will come into emission. So a directly heated vacuum tube like a 5R4, rectifier tube, you know, 5Y3, 5U4, all those types of vacuum tubes where the filament is the cathode, that's a directly heated vacuum tube, and they're pretty much plug-in wait two seconds and you can test them. These you have to wait about 15 seconds or so before you can test these. So let's test it for emission. And that's well into the good area. As you can see, no problems there. So I'm going to test these for shorts. I can move all of the levers here except the letter D. So it's in the short position. So I'll move this one. I want to move all the levers back to their original positions as well. So if this stays on at any time, I have a problem. So A, no problem. B, E, F, and G. No problems there. Now I want to repeat that in the leakage position. Got to leave D alone. No problems whatsoever. And the emission is very good for this vacuum tube. So I can leave everything set up the way it is. Pull this tube out. It's nice and warm now. Plug it back in here. Put the shield back on. And do the same with this one. Nothing has to be readjusted. I can just plug this one in. So if you have a whole series of vacuum tubes, like 6BA6s or something like that, you have to just set it up once. The only thing you have to do is, you know, for the shorts and the leakage, you have to move the levers around. But other than that, you can leave pretty much everything the way it is. So again, I'm waiting for the cathode to warm up inside this tube so that it comes into emission. So I can get a good idea. I'm pretty sure both of these tubes are going to be just fine. Okay, let's try it out. Yep, no problems there. That's nice and strong. So again, move the levers, keeping an eye, of course, on the short slight. And now in the leakage. Two good tubes. We're on our way. At this point, I'm pretty much ready to start the alignment procedure here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that alignment procedure in a second. There's a few things that I ran into when I was trying to put these knobs on this unit. I really think they look a, a lot nicer than the factory ones. They may even end up just staying on this little pre-selector. So the center shaft here going through the wafer switches was the big issue. Now, this is one of the factory knobs, and as you can see, the little set screw is down in there. But if you look at the set screw and the way the line is, so the set screw is like this, all right? So the set screw is like this, but the line is off to the side, which is really odd. So you can see how they're offset, line here, and then this is centered. 
Now, if you look at the shaft here, this will tell you exactly my issue. You see the half shaft in there? You see how they've, they've notched that shaft or indexed the shaft for a set screw? Well, look where the set screw on the new knob is, and look where the index on the shaft is. So you can see a little index down in there, how it's kind of a half shaft. You'll notice that it's kind of coming in off to the side. Well, normally that won't work because when you tighten down the actual set screw in here, when you tighten that screw in, what it's going to do is it's going to shift this because this is going to want to go right to the flat side of that index shaft. So what I had to do to make this work is I had to take a VR. Let's see if I have another one around. I do. So I had to take a VR like this, and what I did is I just broke these off. So I took half of this shaft off. And then what I did at that point is right in here, with this knob removed, of course, I glued half of that shaft onto that half portion. So to make up for the amount of shaft that they've taken off. And then what I did is I filed it perfectly around. Now this isn't really a half shaft, it's more like a three quarters. They've indexed it three quarters the way out. And this here had to be filed down in order to make that truly round in there. So what I did is I used a bit of super glue on this and super glue bonds aluminum immediately. So you put it on the shaft here and you make sure it's centered and then push that down on the shaft and it's part of that shaft at that point. Now, of course you can always get it off by breaking that, you know, if you used a pair of wire clippers or something got between it and pinched it, I'm sure it would come off, but it's, it's really, really solid in there. So once the glue was set, I just filed the shaft perfectly around again so that it's a round shaft. And the advantage of having that piece of aluminum there is that these little screws here have a point on the end and they're designed to dig into either, you know, an index shaft like this is designed to dig into the flat portion of it so that it doesn't loosen off. Well, since this is digging into the side portion of the aluminum, it's pushing right into it and it's tightened down, this will never move because the aluminum is soft and the shaft is tight in that little brass ring inside the knob. So there's a little brass ring inside this knob. Now, most all knobs that you buy like this will have the arrow directly, like the arrow would be at 12 o'clock and the screw would be at six o'clock. In this case, the, you know, the screw would be at say six o'clock and the arrow would be at maybe one o'clock. And that's what they've done, which is really strange. Very, very strange thing to do on this. So, you know, substituting knobs on something like this becomes quite an issue because, you know, this is like this and this is over this way a little bit. Maybe just a, between 12 and 1 o'clock, I would say, is where they put that line. Very strange. So when I tightened this up, it was, uh, you know, quite a difference. So if I had this over at position number 1, this would actually be pointed at 2. So it would be like 1, 2, and then there would be one more notch and the arrow would point here for 3. So that definitely had to be corrected. You can see there's a little bit of, this here could be over this way a little bit more. This, this index shaft is much the same, but it worked out to be not too bad. Little things that you would never notice unless they were mentioned, right? So, very interesting. You know, put that right up like this. So you can see that half shaft is perfectly like this, yet the screw comes in on the side. So, that took quite a bit of filing, and then if that wasn't enough, I had this all cleaned out. All of this was completely clean at this point. You can see how nice and clean this is now. So clean the plastic and everything before I put the bezel on. Well, when I was filing the aluminum, the aluminum filings are so fine that that little hole that's underneath this knob here, so there's a little hole where the shaft comes out. It's a little bit larger. I don't know if you can actually see that. Not really, I guess. Anyways. The hole in the bezel is a little larger than the shaft, and of course this being plastic gets a bit of a static charge on it, especially if you wipe it. So as I'm filing this, you know, very fine aluminum grit is getting in under this thing, and then once you wipe the window once, it all just sticks right to the inside of the plastic, and I'm like, ah! So I had to take this knob off, take the plastic off, and clean this all out again and get rid of all the aluminum dust that was inside here. This is just dust on the outside. So cleaned that out really well. So this thing is definitely putting me through my paces. 
at any rate. So now we're pretty much ready for alignment. Here's the next issue. So I found some alignment paperwork for this thing. So they say band one, and they show everything to align here. So, you know, band one, it's supposed to be at four megs. And you can see it tells you here. So you align this to four megs. I'll explain the alignment procedure here in just a moment in, in you know, great detail. So they say band one, and they tell you to align these coils. But nowhere in the alignment sheet do they tell you what coils and which capacitors are which. Well, that's a lot of fun. So here's a little trick that you might not know about. And this applies to signal generators, receivers. It'll reply or uh, apply to uh, all sorts of different types of equipment that have RF coils in them. So you'll notice on the piece of paper here, we have frequencies that go from 4 megahertz all the way to 28. And... One thing that you always need to remember is whenever you see a coil and a trimmer capacitor, the coil is almost always for the alignment at the bottom portion, and the trimmer is for the top portion. So if you have to align the dial accuracy, you're always aligning the coil at the lower end of the dial, and you're aligning the trimmer at the top end of the dial. Something to remember that's very important, and that could save you a lot of time. So now, we can see here four megacycles, all right, it says iron core, again, this, you know, this uh, uh, coil right here. And then for the top, it says the trimmer, which is a trimmer capacitor. Now, what set of coils is for what band? Does it start here? Does it go here? How are they doing this? Well, if you don't know, it's painful to try and follow wires in a tight area like this. What you do is the lower the frequency, the more coils there are. So the more coil there is on the form. As you get higher in frequency, there progressively gets a least amount or a lower amount of coil as you go towards the top. So the top would be the least amount of coil, and the lower portion of the band is the most amount of coil. So if we take a really close look in here, we can see that there's a lot of coil on that form. There's wax over top of it. And if you look at this one here, you can actually see the coils through the wax. You can see the, the turns there. So we know that this is a really fine coil wound on this one. And this one here is the least amount of coils. And if you look at the center one here, you can tell that it has less coils than the first one. See that? So you can see the outline under the wax there. So that tells us right there that this is the lowest portion. This would be the second and this would be the third. So as we're aligning this and going through step, through the steps here, four and seven are these two and these two. Next would be 7.5 and 14, 7.5 and 14, so these two. And then we know that 16 and 28 would be 16 and 28 right here. So two little tricks to remember if you're ever caught in a receiver. Another thing to do in a receiver is just say you're working on a, a radio receiver of some sort, some communications receiver or you know even an old shortwave radio. If you can't find an alignment procedure for the coils, what you can do is tune the band on the receiver into a, onto a station. Take an insulated screwdriver like this so once it's tuned to a station and it's receiving, just say it's out of alignment, what you can do is you can bring the screwdriver close to the coils on the coil form, and if it pulls it off frequency, you know that that coil is affecting that band. Very simple. So there's a few little tricks. If you've built the Super Probe that's available on Patreon, all the schematics and diagrams and printed circuit board layouts and everything are there. If you've built the Super Probe, you can simply take the Super Probe and just put the probe tip close to the coil. And if it's active, the green LED on the Super Probe will light up really bright. So you can go from coil to coil and find which ones are active in circuit very quickly without having to hook a scope up or do anything. So that's another neat little trick. So if you have that tool available, many people have built this already. If you have that tool available, that also makes life a lot simpler. I'm now ready to perform the alignment procedure on this little pre-selector, signal amplifier, signal booster, whatever you want to call the thing. So I have my signal generator running to the antenna input jack right here. So my signal generator comes in here, goes into this box, and then it splits off into these two jacks. And this runs off to the spectrum analyzer, what we're going to be looking at here in just a moment. 
So if we look at the alignment procedure here, we start here and work our way down. Now in a lot of alignment procedures, it doesn't tell you the order in which way to work. Another thing that you should remember, this is another trick, is always start at the lower portion and work your way to the highest frequency because in receivers or pre-selectors or signal generators with flying leads attaching to coils, usually there is some form of interlock, it's called, between the coils in each section. So if there's interlock between the coils because of these flying leads, if you adjust the highest frequency first, when you adjust the lower frequencies, when you change the tremor capacitors and move the coils around, a lot of the time it'll drag the higher frequency slightly off. So your dial accuracy will suffer if you do it in reverse. Something to always keep in mind, and this is very important, so don't forget that. Always start with the lower frequency and work your way up to the highest frequency. Once you've done the alignment, everything is good, do it one more time. And then that way you are, you know, you have your alignment the best that it can be. You also want to wait for the device to warm up for a period of time before you start doing your alignment, especially if it's a vacuum tube, receiver, signal generator, whatever. The unit needs to come to temperature. If you align it when it's cold, when the thing gets hot, the alignment will suffer again. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind. Some receivers, you'll notice on the bottom panel that there will be holes in the bottom panel for you to poke tuning tools through to tune the receiver. Receivers that have those holes in the bottom panel, for example, Halicrafters SX28A or 28, receivers like that, you want to make sure that the device is in the case when you align it. So you have to have the receiver in the case or whatever you're aligning in the case when it has those holes. Reason being is when you put that metal cover back on, so say you're, let's put this down over here, so you slide this thing back into its case, you have a metal shield that's going to run up over here. The coupling between the circuitry and the shield, so the capacitance between the flying leads and the metal case changes the alignment really bad on the upper bands. So you'll find even in some cases with some of the more expensive communications receivers, they have either in their service manual, they have a plate that you're supposed to put over the bottom of the receiver with all the holes cut out in the appropriate area and you clamp the plate down and do your alignment. And then when you're done, you take the plate off and you can slide it back into the case. Or again, you know, for, uh, you know, for example, the Halicrafters SX28, they have a holes punched in the bottom panel so that you slide the receiver back in, tip the receiver on its side, and then do the alignment through the bottom. Another thing to keep in mind, much of the time there is coupling between the oscillator circuit in a receiver or signal generator to the actual case itself. This doesn't have an oscillator section in it. This thing is just a, a tuned RF amplifier really is all it is. So, you know, it's not going to be affected too much. And if we do slide this back into the case and, you know, say, you know, this is supposed to be nine megahertz here and it's up here or you know say down here or up here somewhere as long as it's within the area you're going to hear the difference on the receiver as you tune past it you'll hear the static you know you hear you'll hear a rise in static if there's no station there and of course if there is a station the station will get stronger as you slide over it with the needle so this is kind of self-explanatory this is just a guide to get you into the you know close to the area but again we're going to align this to as accurate as possible. So a few other things to keep in mind just before we start this alignment procedure. So what I'll do, this here isn't on right now. So what I'm going to do is move this over. Again, this is, a, is not a radio receiver. So having this thing completely up to temperature isn't so incredibly important. So what I'm going to do, this is attached to my isolation transformer, Variac and current limited supplier right now. So I'm going to do the alignment like this. I will wait for this to warm up after we've done the alignment and I'll do the steps over one more time. But I'll do this just to give you an example of how to align something like this. And this kind of alignment falls in line with pretty much any older radio receiver. So if you're following along, remember there's high voltage in these units all over the place. If you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Be very, very careful. This unit here is was built before the had all of these stringent rules for AC line, i.e., example, look at this, the AC line's exposed right here on the transformer, right? And the case comes right up to the backside of this. In fact, it squishes the cord against the backside of the transformer, as you can see. 
So the you know there are no stringent rules. There there were exposed AC connections all over the place in this unit. So you got to be very very careful when you're working on this. Again, if you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Know the risks of working on equipment like this before you start. If you don't know the risks, definitely don't work on this. And if you're unfamiliar with stuff like this, don't work on it because you can really give yourself a bad shock. So what I'll do is I'll turn this thing on now. So turn on my isolation transform and variac supply. Would it be nice if they put some lights in the dial? The dial is just dark. Maybe maybe a future modification or something like that it might look really nice to have a maybe a couple of hidden lights in the bottom here shining up on the dial to light that up and look really nice uh, beside the little receiver that we're going to use this with here in just a moment. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the signal generator and the spectrum analyzer now. So I'll just slide that in on the screen. So below, you can see I've got the signal generator set to 4 megahertz, and the, the strength of the signal is set to 1 millivolt output right now, and that's coming out of this coaxial cable right here. On the top, I've already preset the spectrum analyzer, so the start frequency, if we go here, frequency. So the start frequency is 2 megahertz, and the stop frequency is 9 megahertz. Okay, so I'll just push marker and get this off of the screen here. So if we look here, we have to align at 4 and 7. So I have the start at 2 and I have the stop at 9. So this way we're going to get both of the peaks on the screen. They'll be at close to either end. If I had the start frequency at 4, you know, the, the peak would be right at the edge of the screen, right? Like almost going off the screen. So that's why I start at you know, 2 mega cycles before and I stop at 2 mega cycles after. So you'll see what I mean here in just a few moments. That's why I've set that. So when I set 7.5 and 14, I'll probably go, you know, like say 5.5 and maybe 16 or something like that, just to give it a little bit of room. It really doesn't matter as long as it's just a little bit beyond the limits of what we're looking at. You'll see what I mean here in just a moment. So this here should be warm enough now to start the alignment. So what we want to do is we want to align four mega cycles first. So we want to make sure that this is on. So now it's the unit is in line with the signal generator. So this is acting as an amplifier. Make sure the gain is at its maximum. Make sure we're on the right band. We are. So now I want to tune this to four on here because we have to align the dial accuracy, right? So I'll tune that to four right there, as close as I can get it. Move this over here. And if we look at the spectrum analyzer, you can already see the peak there. So now what I want to do is I want to peak both of these. These are very fine little slots, so sometimes I have to fiddle around with a screwdriver to get this, this little... You can see the uh, little tool inside there. To get that inside the little slot there in the alignment in the actual coil form is really rough. They could have made them just a little bit wider, but I guess that's the way they did it. So at any rate, so what I want to do now is tune these coils. I'll start with this end. It really doesn't matter. If you see a signal, you can just go back and forth. It's not too big of a deal. If you don't know what you really want to do, just say there is no signal, you want to start with the first RF amplifier first and then move to the second and kind of go in that order. But this is not too incredibly important here. So see if I can align this. I can get a little tool in there. As you can see, it's really, really finicky, but when it locks in, it locks in tight. So there it is. Okay, so take a look at the spectrum analyzer screen. Now, I'm not looking for any special measurement. I'm just looking for a peak. That's it. And a lot of the time when you're using a spectrum analyzer, that's all you're doing with it. So a lot of technicians and engineers make spectrum analyzers sound like these big scary devices that you need years and years of education to use. Most of the time when you're using a spectrum analyzer, you're using it for things like this. So anyways, take a look at the peak. See the peak rising up? See, so if I turn it and I detune it, you can see how it goes down. So I just want to tune this for a maximum. And right there is a maximum on the screen. Then I'll go to the next one here, and I'll do the same with this. And you see it came up just a little bit more. Let 
So go back to this one. And that is about at its maximum right there. So that completes this step right here. So now we want to go to 7 megs, so we have to move everything to 7 megacycles. So i got to move my signal generator to 7 megacycles. So I'll go 7 megahertz. So now we're at 7 megahertz. And I will move the dial here to 7 megs. This is in reverse. You turn it this way and it goes this way, so it gets kind of confusing. A cheaper way to do drives for these things. No gearing, right? <laughs> okay, so now I need to adjust these trimmers. So what I'll do is grab my tool right here. Now you can see there's a nice strong signal there. So what I want to do is adjust these. So I'll adjust this one here first. Wow, lots of signal there. And I'll adjust this one here second. You can see how just ever so slightly moving this brings it up and down, so we're looking for a peak. And right about there. So now, what we want to do is we want to check to make sure that the dial accuracy is still okay. A lot of the times when you adjust the upper portion, it'll drag the bottom portion off. So what you'd have to do is drag the bottom portion and it'll pull the upper portion. You, you, pull, you, you adjust the upper and it does this and you can stretch the band out or by going back and forth, you can shrink it up. So right now we need to go back and check this and you can see it says right here, Adjust steps one and two until both ends of the band track. So when they say track, that means that these align up. So the seven will align up with seven. So when I go back to four now, I'll go back to four, like so. Get it as close to four as possible. Now I'll set the signal generator back to four, four megahertz. And as you can see, we have the signal on the screen again. So what I'm going to do is rock this control here and see if it goes down on either side. As you can see, it's going down on either side. So I know that I'm tracking really, really well. So what I'll do is just make sure this is absolutely peaked up since we adjusted those other capacitors. So you can see it's right at four. I stopped right at four using the spectrum analyzer just by using this as a reference to maximum amplitude. So maximum amplitude is as we get higher on the screen, right? So I'll just go in here and touch up these alignment points again to see if we can get any more out of there. Now that's right at the top. And make sure there it is, it locked in. And that's right at the top. So this is perfect. So if we go and just verify the upper portion of the band again, one more check. So I'll go seven megahertz. And I'll move this up to seven. As I get close to seven, you'll start to see that rise up. See this? How sensitive that is. You can see just a random noise. It's amplifying there. You can see that second little peak moving up. So that's where this is actually pointing. And you can see 7 megahertz start to come up because it's so sensitive. And then when those two peaks match, it's going to be maximum sensitivity right there. Look at that right there. So now what I'll do is I'll take a look at the dial accuracy and look at that. It's right at 7. And that is the alignment procedure for this band here. Next, we'll do band number two. Okay, we're ready to align band number two. So we have to make sure that this is on band number two. You see here, little arrow, let's move this out of the way. Band number two now. You need to make sure that the amplifier is in line. We want maximum gain. When I move this to band number two, I bumped this with my hand. That's why it was down a little bit. And we want to set the dial to 7.5. So 7.5 is that little mark right there. So you want it about as close to being on top of that little mark as possible. And 
And now we need to set the signal generator to 7.5. So we'll go 7.5 megahertz. And we would need to set the spectrum analyzer to, we'll say 5.5. So we'll go uh, frequency, start frequency, 5.5 megahertz. And we want to go stop frequency. You can see here the stop would be, so it's 14, so we'll say 16. We'll go 16 megahertz. So start is 5.5, stop is at 16, and I'll get rid of that stuff on the screen so we don't need that. And we can align this up now. So again, we'll start with the coils first and then move to the top portion. So we're already aligned up there, so what I need to do now is just go for maximum. Taking a look at the spectrum analyzer here again. See down here is where it is. I have something else up here, probably just a signal. In here. There it is. It's there. Now I'll go over to this one here. Again, we're just looking for maximum amplitude. Okay. Now keep in mind that the amplitude on these is not flat by any means. It's not flat at all, so you'll find that there'll be lower amplitude in one area and higher in the other. Definitely not flat. In order to make a device like this completely flat, that's what makes test gear so incredibly expensive. So when you're looking at a spectrum analyzer, it's flat. So the amplitude is the same all the way across, and that's what costs all the money when you're designing a spectrum analyzer is to do that is to make everything the same amplitude all the way across so something like this there is definitely not that kind of time and money put into something like this this was a kit right so a lot of people wonder why spectrum analyzers and a lot of this equipment you know special signal generators and things like that are so expensive and that's exactly what it is is to you know to keep the amplitude the same as you move things around lots and lots of uh design goes into that. So we'll just up the uh, signal level here just to get more of a display on the screen without me having to mess with the uh, with the spectrum analyzer. So we'll say uh, we'll go 5 millivolts. There we go. That's a little bit bigger there. So now what we want to do is go to the upper portion. So it's 14 megs. So we got to take the dial here and roll this up to 14. I'm remembering to turn this the opposite way now. 14. And we'll set the, you can see there's a nice peak there. Set this to 14 megacycles, and there it is. So now, what I need to do is adjust both of these trimmers. So we'll start with this one here first. And we'll go to this one up here. You see if you turn this one, it's very sensitive on this stage right here, right? So again, maximum amplitude is right there. Now, if we switch this out of line, so I can turn this so the amplifier is in line, and if I turn this and click this out of line, we can see the difference in amplitude. So when this is out, the amplitude, the amplitude should drop, right? Because this is acting as an amplifier. So here we go. Look at that, how much that drops. Right? This is going to get a little bit larger over here because now this is out of line, right? So this isn't being very selective because this thing is just bridged right through. So this is a signal I probably have here in the lab somewhere. So... There you go. This is 10 dB per division, so that looks about right. So here we go. Now I'll click it back in line, watch the amplitude. Bam. So it's definitely amplifying. No problems. And if I bring this back down to 7.5, so we'll go 7.5 megahertz. And I'll roll this down and see, if I, see how close we can get just by moving this. So I'll bring this down.
and we want to bring this to maximum amplitude. I'm just looking at the spectrum analyzer right now. All right, so now let's check the accuracy of this. And look at that, spot on 7.5. And that's that little notch that's right hiding underneath the needle there. See that little notch? That little line there? Right spot on. Looking very good. So things are tracking. Again, we'll check the gain. So I'll take it out of line. Way down there. Right? Bring it back. No problems. Amplifying. Amplifying quite nice. Again, 10 dB per division, right? So it's definitely doing its job. Very good. So now, we need to align the last one. You know what? Why don't we align this here again? Look at this. I'm just going to totally butcher this alignment so that we can do it again. So I'll stick this in here. I'm not even looking at anything. Turn this like this. Turn this like this. And I'm going to turn this like this. How do you like that for just butchering up the alignment? Okay, so now I didn't look at the screen, didn't do anything. I just turned everything and made everything all messy. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use a different piece of test gear to align this. And it's called a wave analyzer. Now, I've never shown this piece of equipment in action on this channel before, and a lot of people always ask, they say, you know, all of this test equipment, you know, I've never seen this piece running or this piece running before, and that's just because it's a lot of the time it's hard to get the camera to look at some of this gear. And many of you have probably never seen how a wave analyzer works before. So, we'll take a look at the Hewlett Packard 312A with its nice Nixie tube display and we'll perform this alignment again using the wave analyzer. Let's realign band number two using a wave analyzer. So we'll take a look at the wave analyzer now. I haven't set it up yet. I just turned the thing on so you might see a little bit of movement in the digits there. It's only been on for about well, maybe five to 10 minutes at this point. They really should warm up for quite some time. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the little preamplifier here, signal booster, pre-selector, whatever you want to call it and set that to 7.5. So that's 7.5 there, 7.5 megahertz. We are in band number two, it's in line and the sensitivity is to its maximum. Now I'm gonna set the signal generator, that's the device with the red numbers on it, to 7.5 megahertz. That was just under the spectrum analyzer. Now I'm gonna adjust the wave meter here. So. We need to bring this to 7.5. That should be close enough. Fine here. That should be good right there. So now I'll adjust the sensitivity. Make it a little bit more sensitive. And what I'll do is adjust these two coils here, lower end of the band, adjust the coils. So here we go. Let's see if we can bring the sensitivity up. Now watch the meter. See how we're looking for a peak again. So the maximum portion of that meter is what we're looking for. So now I'll move to the second one down. Get this thing to lock into that. There it is. Look at that. I'll go back up to the top. Try this one again. And back to the bottom. And there we go. So to give you an idea of how this works, so this is really like a receiver it's very selective with an S meter. So if I move this off frequency just a little bit, see how that just disappears? If I go above, it just disappears. I'm gonna leave this right above here. If I get this too close to the zeros, this will go 499, 500, and it'll flicker there. So that's close enough for the alignment on this thing for absolute sure. 
So there it is, 7.5. So now what we need to do is adjust the upper portion here. So I need to move my signal generator from 7.5 to 14. So I'll put the signal generator at 14. Again, that's the device with the red numbers on it. 14 megahertz. I'll move the display, little dial on this, up to 14. That's right here. Piece of coaxis nicely in the way. Stay. Okay. It's behaving somewhat. There we go. 14. Right there. Now I need to adjust both of these trimmers. I'll put this down and this. And I'll set the wave analyzer here. To 14. That's close enough. And now I'll adjust both of these adjustments here on the little preamplifier. Lots of gain there. And we'll go to the one down here now. That was pretty much at its peak. Right there. So there we go. So again, if I move this off frequency, see how that just disappears? I can also tighten this up by using the bandwidth down here, but I have it pretty wide at 3000 cycles. So there it is. To align the upper band in this pre-selector, we're going to use a spectrum analyzer from the 50s era. So we'll take a look at the spectrum analyzer. So this spectrum analyzer goes from about 10 megahertz. It's modified a little bit to go below 10 megahertz, but it goes from about 10 megahertz factory to 44 kilo megacycles, which in today's trendy speak is 44 gigahertz. So quite a device for back in the 50s. So we're going to use this thing right at the bottom end of its spectrum here to align this cute little pre-selector. So the first thing that I want to do is put this thing into band number 3 and bring the dial to 16 megacycles. So band number 3, and we want to tune this. This is band number 3, so we want to bring this to 16 megacycles, which is right here. Right, about right on top of that, as close as we can get, right about there. Okay, so now I'll take my signal generator and turn it to 16 megacycles, and there it is on the spectrum analyzer. So what I'm going to do is take these two coils here and move them around. I'll use this end here, and I'm just tuning for a peak. Looks like this one has peaked up. So I'll move these. You see how amplitude goes down? Again, we're looking for the maximum amplitude. That'd be right there. I'll go to this one right here. So this is the other one now. And it looks like these two are peaked. Hmm, at least the upper band looks like it was somewhat in alignment. So there's that right there. So now, what I need to do is go to the upper portion, which is 28 megacycles. So move the dial to 28. Right about there. Make sure it's right on top of it. It is. And I'll move the signal generator to 28 megahertz. And now I need to adjust the spectrum analyzer. And there it is. Gain down a little bit here. Hope
hope that's bright enough. Now what I need to do is adjust the two trimmers. So we'll just do that right now. Again, looking for the maximum. Very touchy. And we'll go to this one here. That's really close, this one here. So I'll touch this one up here again. Trying to get it to its absolute peak and just breathing on this screwdriver moves it. I can see the case coupling with this just a little bit. See if I move my hand close to it. Yeah, it does affect it very slightly, but it does. See, go down. So there we go. So now what I'm going to do is bring this back down to 16 again. So move this back down to 16. right there turn the signal generator to 16 again and I'll move this back so I'll move the spectrum analyzer down so there it is now what I'm going to do is just rock the control on the front here so the main tuning and move it around and see if I can get any more amplitude if I can that means that I still need to align this Probably go one more round. Let's see. Right there. Let's see. Well, I don't know. That's right on top of 16. So I'll just make sure this is all peaked up here. And I think at this point, I'm pretty much good to go. So here we go. One more time. Yeah, that's peaked right up. Okay. The reason that you see it going up and down, bumping up and down like that so dramatically is the slug inside the, the form here is not the same size as the form and I can move the slug back and forth this way by pushing on this, moving this back and forth. That's the reason they have that little piece of steel there. That's to tension this, to hold it in one spot. So the thing is, when on these upper frequencies, things get very, very sensitive. Very, It's the same thing with receivers as well. So when you're moving these around, you got to be very, very careful. And you kind of want to leave them pushed this way. You can see the little spring clip is pushing on this right here. So you want to leave it pushed that way. So what I'm going to do here is just touch this up. Right about there. And that should be at its absolute peak. So I can slide this thing back into its case now. I'm going to link it up to a receiver. and Let's see how well this thing works. Let's see the amplitude difference here. I'll click this thing out of line. So watch the spectrum analyzer. Wow. Lots of difference on this band. So that's through. You're seeing the signal generator through, going through this thing, just directly connected. And now the amp is in line. Working very, very well. Here's an example of two really small pieces of communications equipment. This is the Echophone EC1 communications receiver. So this is a general coverage communications receiver, which means it goes from the broadcast band all the way to 30 megahertz with no stops in three bands. You see how small it is compared to my hand. And this is the device that we just worked on. The pre-selector or pre-amplifier, signal booster, whatever you want to call it. So I have everything tuned right now to a really weak radio station. I tried to find the best example that I could to try and pull out of the, basically pull out of the mud, I guess you could call it. So what I'm going to do is turn this up just a little bit. And you'll hear a little bit of a radio station in there way in the background. And it's pretty much inaudible. So I gotta be careful with the volume control because when I click this on it gets really loud. 
Okay, so now I'll click this in. From not being able to hear anybody to being able to hear somebody talk. Pretty incredible. You can see, hear how well that picks the receive up too, as, as well here. You can see. So you can see how important it is to tune this in so that they both match. So this is right at six megahertz, and we need this right at six megahertz as well. And that's what a pre-selector does, basically just a tunable RF amplifier. Here's another example of a signal around 4.5 megacycles. So you can hear, it just sounds like static. And that's the whole purpose of this, is to take a signal that you can barely hear. In this case, without this, you wouldn't even hear that signal. So it takes a signal that you barely hear and amplifies it enough just to make it intelligible so that you can figure out what's going on, so that you can hear the broadcast. So, as you can see, the Signamax works very, very well. I'm very happy with it, and I think these two will look very good together. I hope you enjoyed this video involving this RF pre-selector. If you did enjoy the video and you'd like to see more videos like this, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos coming in the future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronics alike. So there'll be a lot of repairs, restorations, troubleshooting, and even some electronic design on this channel. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, or you might just be interested in some of the devices that I've designed, you're going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video description under the Show More tab. So just below the video description is a Show More in capitals. If you click on that, it'll expand that section and the link will be in there. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.